Okay, so it's uh, 5 p.m. European time and good local time to everyone. Welcome to another uh, BDEF CPR uh, online seminar. And today we are super happy to have uh, Kate Casey from, from Stanford presenting some of her work uh, with, um, with Rachel Glenister from, from Chicago. And probably most of you, the ones I see here are usual participants, so you know the, the rules of the game. But, but basic, give me, let, let me give you a quick reminder here. So Kate will present uh, for, for an hour. It, during the talk, you can make your questions in the Q&A section of, of Zoom, and we will uh, select some of these questions uh, to ask them during the talk uh, to Kate. And, and, and in any case, we're going to give her the log of all the, uh, all the questions that have been submitted in the Q&A. And if you have any, any questions in which you would like to elaborate or, or, or you feel like you need more clarification, uh, in the last 15 minutes of the seminar, you will be able to uh, just raise your hand virtually and ask your questions directly to, to Kate. All right, so um, you came here to listen to Kate and not me. So Kate, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours for the next hour. Great. Thank you, Jean-Marco, so much for the invitation. It's wonderful uh, to be able to share this work with you. As Jean-Marco mentioned, this, uh, this paper is called Scaling Political Information Campaigns, and it's joint work with Rachel Glenister, who's at the University of Chicago. So if we start with just some kind of very high level motivation, if you look at low income countries around the world, many of them appear to be trapped in something that looks like a low information, low political accountability equilibrium. So you can think about countries that you know, relatively recently transitioned to electoral democracy. So you have you know, some pretty functional free and fair elections, but you know, voters might not have a very good understanding of what government does. They might not have very good information on who their candidates were. They might not know how well incumbents have performed in office. So you have this kind of breakdown between the introduction of democracy and the kind of accountability pressure that we expect, right? So, so the kind of idea is voters are gonna find it difficult to vote out bad performers and vote in good performers if they don't really have any information on, on which one which politicians fall in which bucket. So the, the big picture question is how can you move from that towards a different scenario where actually voters are quite well informed, they use information to vote you know, sensibly, so you know, going for the best candidate, the ones with the best record, and then politicians in turn feel this electoral pressure to perform well in office. So we've kind of tightened up this accountability loop. So, if you there, there's several studies that provide you know governments with some tools that could be useful specifically about information. So you know you have audits in Brazil or you have like candidate report cards in India and other countries. In our own work, we looked at you know public debates between candidates. So you know these are pretty rigorous studies that are showing actually providing information could be part of the solution here. Now, not all information studies are effective, but, but here's a bunch of tools that have worked in, a, in different contexts that, that you could choose amongst. But a challenge here is that many studies like this are based on these really tightly controlled, very resource intensive demonstration pilots. So it's like a proof of concept that these things can work, which raises a second issue that how do you, trans, how do you transition from what is usually like an externally donor funded demonstration pilot to a large scale domestically owned political information campaign, right? So to make this transition from this demonstration pilot to like a nationwide policy requires several things, but, but the ones we're gonna focus on are four. So candidates need to be willing to supply information. So they need to be willing to participate in an initiative that they know that's gonna give voters very rich information. Voters to some extent are gonna be, they're gonna to have to have some willingness to pay for the information. You can think about this, they need to travel to access it or you know, pay some sort of subscription service. And if you're taking the donor, the donor money out, you're gonna to have to find some financially sustainable dissemination model. So, so how can you get this information out at relatively low cost? And then you know, it's gotta work at scale. So all the things we know about why it's difficult to take something small and make it big, 
you need to, we need to have a way that you can extend the reach and lower the cost and still get similar results as you saw in the pilot. Okay, so these are the kind of general big, question, big picture questions that we're interested in. And we're gonna explore, explore these questions in the context of a particular application. So let me tell you a little bit about the application, which is, which is this paper I mentioned here on Canada Debates, um, which definitely has all of these characteristics in terms of being a very tightly controlled resource intensive pilot. So let me show you what this looks like. So um, Rachel and I with Kelly Bidwell did a study around the 2012 elections in Sierra Leone, which were debates between candidates for parliamentary elections in Sierra Leone. So the debates were filmed. So here's on the left, this picture is a still from one of the debates. And so you can see the, the gentleman in green and red, those are the candidates from the major parties. Uh, the gentleman in the glasses here, he is a moderator from Search for Common Ground, which is a very well-known media nonpartisan NGO. And this gentleman in orange is from the third party, uh, which is now defunct uh, at the time. And so what these debates were, where there's this, this level playing field where all candidates could come forward, they discussed policy questions. So, you know, these are very civil debates, they're focused on policy, on merit. Uh, so they're very rich, very rich information that's provided. And then the way this information was delivered to voters is this picture on the right, which is via a roadshow. So that's, that's literally a roadshow because it's a truck. And, and that gentleman, he's loading up the equipment into the truck. So he, there's a generator, there's a sound system, there's a projector. And this truck went around to rural communities and projected the videotape of the debate on the side of the polling center itself. Think of these as like big public gatherings. So a couple hundred people gather, watch the debate, and the, the pilot, so we evaluated this through randomized control trials. So the destinations of the truck were a random selection of polling centers. So you can come back on election day, you can see how these debates changed voters, how it changed candidate campaign expenditure, and then over the long run, how it changed the accountability of elected members of parliament. So this was the pilot. So this was very popular and very salient at the time. So it was popular with candidates, it was popular with voters, and our partners in government at the time made statements like, wow, this is great. We're gonna make debates mandatory for all candidates in all levels of election, right? So this is all super encouraging. Except as 2018, the next election rolls around, there are no plans in place to actually do that, right? To scale up the debate. So, so the question is, is why? And so that's what we're interested in. So we have this you know, successful pilot that's you know, well-received and then why does this not scale up? domestically. So in this context, we're, we're going to, as we get to the 2018 election, we're going to try to answer two kind of big buckets of questions. So the first is what I just said. So why did this initiative not scale up organically? Like why, why didn't this sort of domestically scale up to cover many more races? And we're going to try to attack this question from three different perspectives. So the first is on the supply side. And I think this is the most intuitive potential stumbling block is this idea that you know not all candidates have very strong incentives to participate in something that is going to give voters very rich information about their performance and their promises and what they intend to do in office right so we're going to look at candidate willingness to supply information flipping to the demand side we also want to investigate voter willingness to pay for information so because that that road show while it was very effective in the pilot, that, that's very expensive and it's just simply not feasible to send a truck to every rural community in Sierra Leone. Remember, this is a campaign cycle. So it's, you know, you've got maybe six weeks to do this before the election and it's just not feasible to do that. So, you know, are voters gonna be willing to at least endure travel or ordeal costs to come and access these debates in let's say a more centralized location? And then related to both of these points is, is there a role for the private sector here? So when you when you take out some of these kind of the embedded subsidies that, that the donor money provides, is there any kind of existing media in this environment that can help with this problem? So we're gonna be looking at radio stations and we're gonna be looking at private sector cinema halls. And so the question is, can they help corral candidates into participation and broadcast this information to voters in a way that's compatible with their own kind of for-profit motives. So, so that's a kind of first set of questions is like, 
um, this organic scaling. And the second is um, if you do scale up, will is it possible for similar results to obtain at scale while you're simultaneously trying to extend the reach and lower the cost of disseminating these kinds of political information campaigns? Okay. So we are gonna evaluate both of these in the context of a truly nationwide field experiment. So all 132 parliamentary races come into our experimental sample in one way or another. And this is all around you know, the election that came after the pilot, which was in 2018. I apologize, I've got super husky smoker's voice. It's like the first time I had cold. First time I've had a cold in like two years. Totally not used to it. <laughs> Kate, um, let me interrupt you before we go into the research design with a couple of questions, uh, mostly sure. clarification that have come up on the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a couple of questions uh, that, that relate to the original experiment. Maybe you can briefly summarize the, the key results on electoral yeah. outcomes, candidate expenditures, and so on. Uh, yeah. And Viola is asking also was this, whether this was organized uh, locally and what was the um, the, the organization taking care of, of, of these, and okay. and and finally, there's another question on on the scale of, of the pilot and whether it was enough uh, to to allow for a push from the demand side to to try to get these things scaled up. Great. Okay. Let me just uh, fast forward my slides because I exactly have that, and then we can come back. Um, Come back to this. So let me let me fast forward to the details of um, the pilot. Okay, so let me do the pilot, and then I'm going to flop. I'm going to flash back to the overall design because these these are great questions and and super important. So so let's dig into the pilot a, a little bit more. So the pilot was in 2012. It covered 14 parliamentary constituencies, and inside these treated constituencies, the the truck went around to 224 villages. So the design there is we have treated, we also randomized at the constituency level. So there are 14 treated constituencies and then there'll be 14 controls. So the main identification for, for voters and for campaigning is within these 14 treated constituencies. So in terms of the partners, um, great question. So the, the NGO partner is called Search for Common Ground. They're a very well-known, very well-respected Nonpartisan, essentially a media group, and they do they do a lot of programming around elections. But I mean, they started basically after the Civil War, doing like sort of more truth and reconciliation kind of peace building process. And so they actually now during elections they serve sort of a coordinating kind of umbrella function to coordinate like all the kind of NGO inputs into the electoral process. So they're a very prominent, very well known partner. Um, in terms of the other participants, so. We got um, candidates from all three parties that contested that election. So the two major parties, which is the All People's Congress, Sierra Leone's People's Party um, participated. And then also this third party I mentioned, People's Movement from Democrat, for Democratic Change, which is essentially a splinter of the SLPP uh, participated, right? So there's a lot of buy-in from the political parties and it had blessing of government from the highest level with respect to the elections, which is the National Electoral Commission. So I think what's nice about this is it had buy-in from civil society, from the political parties, and from the regulator, from the government itself. Um, and then uh, let me show you just the, the results of, of that. So the, the headline results from the pilot were, if you look at kind of compare where the truck went, communities where it went and where it didn't go, you, we surveyed you know, a bunch of voters on election day and so what we can show you is that those who were exposed to the debates had very sizable gains in political knowledge. So these are things like being able to tell you of, of these candidates, you know, who, what are their first priority issues, for example. So all these, whoever's elected gets a big pot of money. It's called the Constituency Facilitation Fund. And then you can say, okay, if you're elected and you get this money, what are you going to do with it? Right, so voters can tell you, well, the APC candidate's gonna spend it on health and the SLPP candidate says he's gonna spend it on education, things like that. You also know like their level of education, who's an incumbent, um, their actual names, so like who they are. So it's a very rich um, gain in political knowledge. We also find that this translates into increased vote shares for the candidate 
who performed best during the debate. So we obviously who performed best, high quality, these are a perennial challenge to measure. But the one I'm gonna focus on today is we had independent experts score all the videos, all the candidate responses in terms of the quality of their response. And then if you look at the official voting returns in the NEC, the National Electoral Commission data, at the point center level, we got on average about a three and a half percentage point increase in votes, vote share for that best performing candidate. So that's the voter side. The second, so that's the big shock, information shock on the voter side. And that shock was big enough that candidates on the other side responded by increasing their campaign effort in those newly informed communities. So the number of in-person visits, you know, kind of passing out t-shirts and food and, and this kind of stuff um, went up a lot. So their investment in those communities increased. So that's that's an endogenous re response on the candidate side. It kind of shows you this is an important enough shock on the voter side that the candidates responded to it. So the third result is then looking at the 14 treatment constituencies were randomly drawn from a group of about 28. And we selected the 28 with an eye towards what we thought would be the most competitive races. So that's what we were trying to get. And so at the end of the day, you can follow the 28 elected members of parliament, uh, or sorry, over time, half of those had participated in debates as candidates and had a huge segment of their, their constituents become very well informed about them. Half of them had not. And then when we audited them two years later, you can see that those elected MPs who participate in debates as candidates actually spent a lot more of this kind of constituency facilita facilitation fund, excuse me, they're kind of public budget on development projects that you can verify on the ground. So I think, and it's not just Sierra Leone, so there's been some RCTs of similar style debates in other countries in the region, so in Uganda and Ghana and Liberia. So it's not like something quirky uh, to Sierra Leone, they seem like a pretty effective tool uh, for this region. And so this is like, we had all these ingredients in place, like it looks like a win, <coughs> at least for voters and for government accountability. So then, you know, why is this next election rolls around? Why are there no plans in place um, to repeat it? Okay, so now let me let me go with there and let me go back to the research, research design. Um, so I, I'll, I'll skip this for time constraints, but you, you can look at, at the slides later. I mean, there's, there's this really interesting, there's a theoretical literature that, that talks about essentially this question of like an equilibrium shift. And I'm using equilibrium shifts kind of loosely here, but like, how do you transition to, you know, how does political accountability emerge? How does that sort of interact with the success of new democracies? All these political responses to high level development policy. And then there's this really cool set of papers coming out now about these empirical considerations when you're trying to scale from a pilot to a, a nationwide policy and even experimenting at the scale of nations or states or, or big districts. And then of course, there's this kind of on running debate about, you know, given that there's a lot of reasons why we should expect different results or be concerned that we'll get different results at scale, maybe we shouldn't be basing public policy on these kind of small scale experiments. Okay, so we're trying to speak to different, different um, threads of, of those sort of three literatures. All right, but here's the scale up design. So remember, we've got kind of two big questions. One is about why did this not scale organically? And that one has sort of three components. So, so let's start there. So here's the next election. There's 100 through 132 constituencies. We, we, we take 70 of those, 72 of those out. And in here, what we're gonna contact every single candidate competing in those races. And we're gonna say, well, Search for Common Ground, this prominent NGO, they actually, they got some money to scale up the debates that they did last time. And they would like to know if you're interested in having your constituency be one of the scaled up debates, right? So, so this, we're gonna go through an exercise of eliciting candidates' willingness to supply information. Here, we're also going to look at, can the private sector play a role in inducing candidates into the supply, right? So we're gonna look at a guaranteed public platform, a radio platform and see do candidates respond to that. And then the second big question is, you know, we so once you scale it up, so now we're gonna have a sample of 90 constituencies, half of which um, have the debates. And then the question is, can you extend reach 
and lower cost and do this whole thing at scale and, and still get similar results, okay? So here inside this, we're gonna bake in that second part of the kind of organic scaling question, which is the demand side. We're gonna elicit voter willingness to pay for the, to access this information. And then we're gonna also look at, can we roll in these private sector cinema halls to try to blast out this information to voters in a way that's kind of compatible with their existing incentives as opposed to um, external funders having to pay for everything. Okay, so because we're asking a lot of different questions, there's a, a, there's a lot of different things going on in this design, but I'll take you through where each question will go through the, the design for each subcomponent, but I would just want you to have a, a big picture sense of what this looks like. So let's start up here with this um, willingness to pay. And then uh, the, we already went over the background, but just for those of you who aren't familiar with Sierra Leone and the pilot, I will say like in terms of my, my motivation of saying kind of low information, low income, low accountability, um, this is a very uh, low income environment and voters, while like public education has really improved a lot in the last 20 years, you still have over a third of registered voters have zero formal schooling. So if you ask voters, you know, some of the basic questions about parliament, they really struggle to tell you things like what are the you know main roles and responsibilities. So there's not a lot of information on the voter side. And then on the accountability side, all these kind of standard international rankings of how accountable and high performing is the government come out uh, with Sierra Leone ranking very poorly um, in those regards. So it's the kind of institutional context where information could have a very big impact. Okay. So we went through uh, the, the results of the pilot. So let's just jump in then to, to this first question about, you know, it's very intuitive to think that not all candidates have great incentives to like tell voters exactly who they are and how much money they're gonna get and what they plan to do with it. So this is the first group of 72 constituencies. So we called all the candidates, most of them, almost all of them agreed to talk to us. <coughs> and as I mentioned, what we said was, so search for common ground, got some money to scale up the debates from the last election. Are you interested in them coming to your constituency? And then if they said yes, we said, okay, fantastic. Call, here's a number to call. And you can tell search that you're interested in, in entering basically your constituency for consideration. So here there's now a huge drop off, right? So we talked to 95% of the candidates only 26% actually called back to express interest in doing this, right? So this concern that we had is like, oh, maybe candidates don't really want voters to have the super rich information that definitely comes up, right? So we've gone like only, we're down to about a quarter of candidates in this one step with like an almost trivial cost to them of just calling a second phone number. Okay, there's some intuitive sources of heterogeneity in, the, in those callback races. So callback rates. So in particular, candidates that are competing in more competitive constituencies are about 10 percentage points more likely to call back and express interest. So just to give you background, um, there's sort of the two largest uh, ethnic groups in Sierra Leone are historically affiliated with the two major political parties. So you can kind of classify constituencies by sort of the, the, the share of ethnic groups affiliated with one party or another. So a lot of those are in like you know 90% APC affiliated in the north or 90% SLPP affiliated in the south. But there are a bunch of constituencies like in the capital in the east that are more 50-50, right? So or have a lot of unaffiliated ethnic groups. So those are the ones, you know, where their electoral stakes are higher that they're more excited about participating in the debate. The other one that I think is intuitive is that these third-party candidates are more interested in participating in, in the debate than the very well-known major party candidates, right? So a similar magnitude, about 11 percentage points. Okay, but coming back here. So the next step was for those who called to say, yeah, I'm interested. We want the debates to come to our constituency. We said, okay, great. Go contact some of the other candidates in the race and agree on a date. Basically like a time and a place. Where we where we can have the debate and we'll because you know this is a logistical challenge to do all these debates and we'll enter that into consideration right so now i've gone from about a quarter of a candidate quarter of candidates now i'm, I'm down to about 10 percent right so okay if you look at this 
you know, these candidates here, these 84 candidates are representing 54 different races. Now I'm down to 31 candidates from 24 races. So, so we lost 30 races from kind of step three to step four. So one thing you can think about is, is can we just sort of characterize these losses? So most of these are due to what we're gonna call persuasion failure, which means at step three up here, there was only one candidate in the race who was interested, right? So one candidate called back and they were unable to persuade other candidates to join them in picking like a, you know, a time and a place to do this. The remaining 20% were coordination failure. So there was more than one candidate calling to express interest in this phase, but they weren't able to coordinate amongst themselves on, on a date and time, right? So I think there, there's, there's sort of the two things going on um, that show us that the willingness to supply information and coordination challenges across parties, this is a very big constraint to organically scaling up political information campaigns. Okay. So, so that's the not, not bad news. This is, you know, we got to be kind of agnostic about this, but, but that's the challenge. So then let's think about how do we solve this problem in wealthier countries? So when you think about it, like in wealthier countries, there, there's some sort of commission, like a independent commission that negotiates coordination across the parties. And then the media, you can think about private and or public disseminates this, right? So in the US, there's these debates, there's a commission that negotiates across parties, you know, how tall will the lecterns be? You know, who gets to stand where? All this kind of stuff. And then you can think about like private media. You can think about CNN, the TV station broadcast, or public media like PBS, public broadcasting system disseminates this. So how is that different than what we just did in Sierra Leone? And is there is there some lower cost media players that we could work with to try to replicate something that looks like you know what the wealthy countries do? So here, the, what we thought about was there are community-based radios whose listenership is roughly contiguous with the boundaries of a parliamentary constituency. So what we said in a subset of 20 of these races, we just told the radio station manager, we'll pay you 200 bucks if you can get at least one candidate to join you in the studio for a live on-air debate. And then all we did was we tracked how many of these stations held a debate and how many candidates um, were participating in the debate. And I think, how does this change the game? Well, it, it changes it in two ways. So one, it's delegating coordination to the radio station manager, and it's introducing this competitive threat. So once you guarantee a public platform, so long as one person shows up, the, 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 the hesitant candidates, are then going to be at a competitive disadvantage in terms of this free campaign advertising if they don't show up, right? So once you guarantee a platform, now I'm worried about somebody else who's willing to participate getting all this free airtime that, that I don't get. Okay, so let's see what happened. So this is back where we started when we have only about 10% of candidates you know, able to coordinate. So then we guarantee these radio platforms in these 20 races and what happens well, we get a huge uptick to 70% of these races are now having a radio debate with two or more candidates. When you think about any debate at all, just the one person showing up, it goes up to 90% here. So, right, so in these 20 races, you know, only two of them couldn't get at least one candidate to show up. And in 70% of them, they got two or more candidates. Now we tracked in a, excuse me, a similar set is called a comparison group because it wasn't actually uh, randomized, but we have nine races that are similar where we called all the radio stations and made sure we're just tracking, you know, word could get out. So we wanted to see, is this kind of just happening naturally? But none of these stations where we hadn't made the initial uh, offer of the, of the payment had any kind of radio debate. So I think we can, we can sum up here and sort of thinking about the supply side, very few candidates were willing or able to overcome coordination costs to schedule and participate in a debate without some sort of external push, right? And this nice paper in Liberia has some similar, similar results. The kind of cautiously optimistic part is that these competitive incentives were very low cost and really very effective in corralling candidates into the debates. We had some RAs review 
the audio tapes of these radio debates and you know they sounded pretty civil we'd actually given the radio station managers the script that search for common ground uses so they'd have like a set of questions so they seem very civil very policy oriented so it's not like this thing went off the rails um when when the kind of external people uh were, were not involved and so i mean Radio debates are not the same thing as video debates, so we don't have a direct mapping on what is the impact on voters of a radio debate versus an audio debate. But if you look at the pilot, like, you know, the video debates were pretty effective. So kind of putting all of these bits of evidence together suggests a supply side is going to be a real, real challenge uh, for scaling. But this so the private sector media in terms of radio stations offers what looks like a cost effective route to, to broader participation and dissemination. So may, let me pause there uh, before going to the demand side. Um, yeah, cool. Um, so th there's a couple of questions. One related to um, <clears throat> to what correlates to with callback and coordination in terms of, of candidate ability, competence, experience, and um, and so on. Yeah. So we don't have a lot. So what what I can show you is sort of the competitiveness of the race and mm -hmm. the major party, minor party. I could definitely look into incumbency because that is kind of easily traced. So we didn't survey these candidates. So I, I don't have a lot of information Let's about see. them, but I could easily get incumbency. That's a great suggestion. I could hmm. get incumbency um, for that. And there's some other kind of cross samples with different arms that we could look at a little bit. But we could look at like gender, age, things like that. Um, hmm. So those are good suggestions. I, I can look into that more, but just say I, I don't have any measure of like ability or anything like that. I see. And, and another uh, question that, that comes up he here is, so what, what was your feeling of what's the constraint on local radio uh, radio stations not to organize it by, by, by themselves? It, it, it said that they didn't think there was an audience for it, or, or, or the, actually having the script is what pushed them uh, because they didn't know what to ask them and... and Descriptively, what was your sense of what was the main constraint there? Oh, well, what did you say was the script? No, I'd say it's the 200 bucks that kind of motiv <laughs> motivated no, them. But but no, 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 why why didn't question. they do it before? Yeah, why didn't they do it before? So I think it's not that candidates aren't going on the radio. So candidates are, are going a lot on the radio. So they also they like make jingles, like campaign jingles that are played on the radio. They will go for like one-on-one -on -one interview on the radios, but that's more just kind of uh, self-promotion in the campaign. Hmm. I think what's interesting about the debates, it's a, this this level playing field. It's a much more competitive, let's say, um, information flow, right? So, so debates are, are are different than just going on the radio and promoting yourself. Is that you're you're debating somebody else, right? So it's this kind of relative benchmark, and you know, you're there's more for the candidates there's a more obvious downside risk to participating in debate than just promoting yourself on the radio, right? Because there's a, the risk that hmm. you come out looking not as strong as the other candidate in certain in certain areas. Um, so I think that's a good, I think it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, okay, that, that's all the questions for now. Okay, perfect. All right, well, let's go, let's go to the demand side then. Okay, so, you know, it's, so we need to, you know, if you think about this, it's like this giant coordination game. There's a lot of different players. We've got the candidates from different parties and we have voters and, and you know, so let's look at the voter side. So there's, you know, there's evidence, you know, except for example, from public health that your willingness to pay might be low. This is a very low income environment. So we need to see are voters willing to endure some essentially ordeal or travel costs to access the information. And this is coming back to the idea that, you know, the road show and the truck is like a very effective way to expose pretty remote voters, but it's very expensive and it's just not feasible to cover the whole country. So when we we're trying to see, could, can we figure out are voters willing to pay to access this to some extent? And it, so what we did is, so now I'm coming down to the bottom where I'm now going a little bit forward in time and where we did the actual, the scale up, the, the large scale experiments. So I'm going down to those 45 treated um, constituencies for the scale up constituencies. And inside those, you know, we have these videos of the debates and, you know, they could just burn them onto DVDs. And what we did was we commissioned these local private cinema halls. So just think about like a, one of these cinema halls are they're, they're kind of like a 
a pretty informal establishment. You know, they have a roof, they'll have like a source of power and their main business is playing premier league soccer or football, right? So, and they charge admission and people come to watch the games, right? And they're very popular. They're all, they're all over the country. <coughs> and so what we did was we approached these cinema halls and we said, look, we have this debate between candidates. Um, can we sponsor one screening? So we'll go pass out tickets and we'll pay for, you know, up to 80 people to come and watch if you'll just, you know, agree to play at one time. And so then what we did was we distributed, so here's the cinema hall. And so we passed out these kind of admit one free, free admission vouchers. So 20 kind of right around the, the actual place where the cinema hall is. So there's almost zero travel cost. And then going at kind of different distance radii further and further away. And so we, from the cinema halls, we have 156 communities at you know, different distances from the hall. And we're passing out you know, 20 tickets in each one. And, and the outcome we're interested in is kind of what's the redemption rate as it relates to how far away and how expensive it is uh, for voters to travel in. So, so this is what it looks like. So if you look at the, the blue line, so remember we've got a 20 right on top of the cinema hall. So here you've got like redemption rates like up towards like 60%, right? So when there's almost zero cost, majority of people are willing to go and check out the debate. And then of course it drops off really steeply as you go further and further away. But in my view anyway, it, re it remains pretty strong. Like if you're here around two miles out, so that's like you know, 45 minutes walking or you know, some cost to take public transport, you're at like 30% redemption rate, right? So, and, and we actually, even going out to eight miles, you're down to like 20% redemption rate. So people are really willing to exert physical effort and walking or so financial costs to take public transport to access these debates. So I think that's actually um, quite encouraging. <coughs> so the second question is, since voters are willing to pay for it, could this be profitable for the cinema halls to play themselves, right? So now just trying to think about, you know, if we take away all the, you know, the subsidies that are embedded in a donor funded intervention, can you make it work in terms of the existing somewhat informal markets that are there? So we wanted to test the second follow-up question. And to do this with these same cinema halls, we didn't take the DVD away when we left. So what we did was we found somebody in the community who had a smartphone, who had WhatsApp, and we asked them, we just take a picture of like, the, it's not the agenda, but you know, the program lineup of the cinema hall every day for the next five days and just send us a photo. And if you ever see a debate on there, would you go and do a quick head count of how many people show up, right? So I just wanna be explicit that there's no request to the cinema hall to play it again. There's no expectation that, they're going to get anything and there's no compensation. It was a one-off for the initial subsidized screening. And we just want to see, do they find it worthwhile to play it a few more times once they've seen that voters, you know, are, are willing to attend. So I think this data is actually pretty interesting. So column one here is just some of the basic summary statistics for that first subsidized screening. So all of the places we contracted with did actually show it once. And, you know, in that one, they got about 23 of the subsidized people coming in. So it's like, you can think about the 80 tickets passed out and how many came in. Interesting, they also had almost 40 unsigned, unsubsidized people coming in once they saw that this was happening. But what's more interesting is then sort of unobtrusively monitoring what happened next. On average, these cinema halls played it two additional times after this first night. Right, and so then, you know, they're charging, it's about like, you know, a quarter, like 20, 24 cents. And this is this is total number of unsubsidized. So, you know, divide by 2.2. So you got about a hundred people showing up per screening, which is, you know, $55 in revenue at almost, you know, very low marginal cost for the cinema halls. And if you look at how many voters were exposed from this, the subsidized screening plus the unsubsidized, you know, we're, we're over like, 11,000 voters at essentially almost no marginal cost in terms of the, 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 the debate intervention. So I think this is super interesting. First, when you're looking at voters, it doesn't seem like the demand side is a big constraint in scaling, right? Voters are willing to, to travel pretty far, 
even if you just think about the cost of the subsidy, it's only like 83 cents per voter of that first night. So that's not very expensive. Even better, you know, just letting the private cinema halls do what they will with the DVD, then, I mean, you're, you're passing the cost on to voters, right? But the voters only having to pay 20, 24 cents to access it. And I think this combination suggests it could be a highly effective dissemination mechanism, right? So, so we're reaching, once you've made the debate, it's very low marginal cost. And I think just the sheer number of voters and that they're coming in from, you know, pretty, well, let's, I don't know how remote, but outlying communities anyway, suggests this is interesting. I think the one big caveat here though is, so this might be like a cost-effective solution to the dissemination challenge, but I think it's, it's unlikely to solve the production challenge, right? So to, just because there's not like big economies of scale because constituencies are relatively small geographic areas. So the someone's got to pay for, it's about $6,000 to make the video in the first place. So I don't think the radio, or sorry, not the radio, the cinema halls are going to be able to like coordinate and get into the production business. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but if you think about like, where is it particularly effective for donors to come in and place some subsidies, you know, if you're willing to subsidize the production aspect, then at least the dissemination part, you'll get way more bang for your buck for trying to like work dissemination into the kind of existing markets that are there. So let me pause there if there's any questions on the demand side. Yes, so th there's a couple of clarification questions from, from Anna. Um, Anna Tom said on, she wants more, more details on how did you decided um, who in the community was going to receive the subsidized vouchers uh, and in the next stage uh, when when you, when um, the cinema screened the, the debates, uh, whether the informants received any incentives? Um... Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, great question. So um, the voters that got the uh, voucher, that was just a random walk around the community. So you start at one house, <laughs> go however many houses down. So it was just, and we didn't collect any information on those people. Um, it's just we're passing them out in kind of a fair way. Um, and then the informant, so the informants got um, the the foam, basically data credit to send us photos every day. That, but that was, that was it. Mm -hmm. so they, they weren't incentivized relating to anything other than just making sure they took a picture every day. Mm -hmm. But the, it and didn't depend on whether the debate was there or not. I see, I see. Yeah, I, I guess that was the concern. And, and the, the cinemas were charging the same price uh, as the, like the regular football match, right. or they were like classical yeah. prices. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. so there's, um, yeah, the, the kind of, the standard price varies a little bit across space, but you know, it's, it's pretty cheap. It's like 2000, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. I think that's really good for now, thank you. Okay. Cool. All right. So then this was all on, this was sort of the three parts of question one. So like when you're thinking about, you know, what are the constraints to this organic scaling? We looked at, you know, the supply side of candidates. We looked at the demand side of voters. And then we looked at the role of the private sector, both in corralling candidates to supply and disseminating to voters at low cost. So now let's look at the kind of second big question is just, if you do scale this up, what you know what are reasons why we might not obtain similar results as we saw in the pilot and and do we have some data that can speak to how how much of an issue those things are okay so again this is like you know this kind of set of concerns about you know if you don't get similar results at scale and this is a really nice uh summary summary paper in journal of economics perspective that actually that journal has a whole symposium issue with like three very cool papers on this topic so i said anyone who's interested I'd suggest checking it out um so, you know, they, they identify, you know, some big categories and I've put some examples here uh, of different studies that, that find this, but so what, what are things that could be different when we go to scale? So, you know, general equilibrium effects, so like prices change, spillovers, so control units are benefiting from what treatment units got, political reactions. I mean, that's actually, we've, we've just spent a lot of time talking about political reactions. Um, so in, in the first part of the experiment, so that strongly shapes what's going on at scale here. Um, context dependence, we won't have too much to say about that, but site selection bias, uh, we will have something to say about just because we, in the original pilot, we were looking at the most competitive constituencies, even though de facto they weren't all that competitive. But now we're, when we're scaling up, we're going all over the country and all kinds of different ones. 
And then this is really important, this kind of this idea of a, a voltage drop. So when you when you lower cost and extend reach, do you get, um, you know, can you get similar results at scale in, in that regard? So we'll be able to say something about everything um, except uh, four, because we're, we're just in very similar context as similar, similar point in time. OK, so this is what the at scale design looks like. So here. Um, so there's now we've got 90 constituencies here. So this is a random assignment just to treatment versus control. Inside each of these 90 constituencies, we're going to select four what are called VRCs, voter registration centers. So this is where voters go to register and then to vote on election day. And so we're going to select them in, in exactly the same fashion. So we'll have comparable results when we get here to the end on election day. We're going to randomly sample six voters from the National Electoral Commission's official register of voters who are registered to those centers. OK, so let me just say one of these is purposely selected, which is the headquarter town. This is the every constituency has a headquarter town. This is where like the, the, the main health clinic is. If there's a secondary school, it'll be here. So it's like the administrative head of the constituency, and it's just a bigger place than, than all outlying areas. So we want to make sure that headquarter is in our sample in both in, in, in all 90 places. And then we're going to take all the other polling centers and we're just like they're they all have a you know numbers of voters assigned to them. So we're just going to take like the big middle. So 25th to 75th percentile in terms of the size of the voter registration center. And we're going to randomly select three polling centers for our sample. We're doing that the same and treatment and control. So you can just think about this kind of typical communities. We have three typical communities and then we have the biggest, most central community. Okay, so in the controls, we're just gonna survey people on election day. We're not gonna do anything else um, until then. But in the treatment, the debate constituencies, we're gonna experiment with you kind of lighter and lighter and lighter touch dissemination mechanisms. So in the one of the typical communities, we're just going to try to do essentially what we did in 2012 in the pilot is, you know, have the film screen and kind of do the same thing. And the question is, you know, there we only had to do 14 in the six week period. Now you got to do 45. Right. So there's there's a lot of logistical challenges just trying to do the same thing again at scale. So but this this is if you want to think about apples to apples comparison, um, this would be the most close to what we did before. And then the blast screen is similar, but we're just gonna we're gonna blast it out in the biggest town. And you can just think, you know, can you just hit more people if you go to the most central, you know, the busiest uh, place? And then this third one is uh, mobilization. So we're not actually gonna show the debate at all, but we're gonna give voters information about where they can access the debate. So they can go to a film screen um, or or the blast screen. We're just gonna say, just you know, telling people how to get it, can you can you get some people um, to be exposed without even you know visiting them with the debate itself? And then the last one, this is a, kind of a within treatment control. And so this is gonna test explicitly for spillovers, right? So is there any constituency-wide spillovers in terms of voters in in communities where where there was no direct interaction? Did they find a way uh, to get exposed to the debate? Okay, so I think there's there's some really interesting things to think about. So even going to scale, there's there's differences in sort of what I call uh, like language of the scale up literature, like adherence, right? So adherence on the candidate side is quite interesting. So in 2012, in the pilot, you know, with all this focus and intensity, basically almost all candidates participated in the debate. So if you look at the major party candidates, there was only one debate where one of those candidates didn't participate. Right. So in, you know, you have 28 major party candidates, only one of them didn't show up. You come to the scale up, oops, excuse me. You come to the scale up and those numbers are a lot lower. So the APC party, only about two thirds of the debates, did they actually show up? So two thirds of those candidates in that race that where a debate was held showed up. It's a little bit higher for the SLPP, about 80%, but putting these things together, you know, before almost all debates, voters saw both major party candidates. In the scale up, that's only happening about half of the debates. So when you think about like 
what is the information that's contained in the debate, you're not getting information on all the candidates in the scale up at this to the same extent that we did in the highly controlled pilot. Second thing is, so there are different third parties in this election than the previous election. Uh, they also, they, they participated, there were fielding candidates in many more races. So in a way they are kind of, um, well, let's just leave it at that. They're, they're a little bit broader scope than this third party, but their participation rates were a little bit low. So overall, we have more candidates in any given debate on average, because there's more parties competing, but the probability of, or the proportion of candidates that were invited that actually showed up is substantially lower. So I'm gonna come back to this, because I think this is a really interesting feature of the kind of political economy around information supply that, uh, that is important for what we find later. Okay, so another point is, remember we're trying to you know, blast this thing out. So the constituency level intensity is, is significantly diluted. So in the pilot, a quarter of all polling centers were visited by that truck in a given constituency. Now only 8% get a blast screen or a film screen, right? So, so this is a lighter, a lighter sort of spraying of this information, if you will. And then we're evaluating progressively cheaper and more and more diluted delivery mechanisms. So we get the film screen all the way down to just sending people text messages and visiting them and say, hey, there's this debate going on, you know, in two days in this other town, you know, you should think about going. Um, this is a little bit less interesting, but, you know, in the pilot, we also, you know, visited voters and surveyed them and this kind of stuff. And we're not doing any of that. We're just coming to voters at the very end of the day. So the main point is overall, many more candidates and voters participated and were exposed, but this is at lower intensity. So there's kind of statistical implications. So this is intention to treat design. So this is gonna have big consequences for statistical power. But I think also just substantively, when you think about kind of common knowledge generation and accountability pressure. So on the voter side, you know, watching this with a whole bunch of people and knowing, you know, talking about it and knowing that other voters have seen it, you know, can kind of get the sort of common knowledge established. And then from the, at the point of view of an elected parliamentarian, knowing that a quarter of your polling centers saw this debate is very different than only 8%, right? So if we, we can think about, we might, these are some reasons why we might expect to have um, smaller effects at scale. Okay, so let me show you what we found. First of all, we, this was successful in exposing voters to debates. So not like in 2012. So in 2012, when you come to voters on in the exit poll, 82% of them had seen the debate. In the next election, 26% of them had seen it in this kind of apples to apples uh, screening in a kind of average size community. 22% um, had seen it in the headquarter blast. So, so that's encouraging. The mobilization worked, and these are the p-values here, the mobilization worked to corral about 6% of voters to go see it. So, so that worked to some extent. And then the survey only, there's absolutely no statistical difference between exposure and treated versus controls. So right here, we can rule out that there was any spillover effects at scale, right? Which remember is one of the key reasons we might see something different at scale. From a policy perspective, this is kind of a bummer because you'd love it for just like this information to be out in the ether and everybody talking about it, I'm going to see it and become this huge thing that you don't have to pay for getting the message out. But, but that's definitely, uh, that did not happen here. So, so that's not going on here. Okay. So here's an interesting supply versus demand side interaction. So remember, not all candidates participated in the debates. So we can predict who's the most popular candidate locally, basically by focusing on, you know, I said there's this sort of regional ethnic strongholds for the APC versus the SLPP. So in those strongholds, we can kind of predict, you know, the, you know, in the North, the APC candidate would be the most likely to win. And then we can look at, did the APC candidate actually participate in the debate? And then when we go to the voter side, we're just asking, you were seeing who was exposed so what's interesting is voters are more likely to attend these screenings if their own preferred candidate is in the debate, right? So I, I think that's interesting in thinking about, you know, this, this, this is a pretty complicated coordination game because now like voters are responding to, depending on how many candidates are showing up. So I think that, that that's very interesting um, in terms of, this one is not statistically significant, but it's kind of going in the same direction. 
Um, so this piloting bias or this like voltage drop concern, uh, we, we did have some problems with that. So this is just the idea that when you're really trying to blast it out, lower the cost, extend the reach, there's, there's a lot of, you run up against capacity constraints. So here's two examples of capacity constraints. So I said mobilization, remember, is like part of that was sending out text messages. When you ask voters, did they receive a text message? Most of the text messages are actually going, here's the p-value, they're going to the film screen and the headquarter blast screen, which is fine, but they're not going to the mobilization communities, right? And this is where you really need them. So this was just some mistargeting of, of that particular mechanism. Um, <coughs> worse than that is our implementing partner was meant to deliver an audio only version of these debates to the community radio stations to then play. And this didn't happen at all. So when you ask, well, do they hear any debate on the radio? There's like, look at the p-values. There's no difference between treatment and control races. So if you want to think about what's the absolute cheapest way to do this would be mostly just to blast it out on the radio. And we can't measure the efficacy of that in this scale up because uh, it's kind of capacity constraints implementation breakdown. So we definitely had some of these piloting bias um, challenges. Um, the other thing you can think about is sort of distributional impacts. So one, one trade-off is going to the headquarter towns is that then you're going to the richest places, right? So these are you know, relatively urban. So if you look at characteristics of voters, rich is based on like, you know, quality of construction of their house and things like that. But you know, people that live in the headquarters are better educated by almost two years and are, are most likely to be in that top bracket in terms of what their house is made out of. So you might worry that there's a trade-off, you know, blasting it out from urban centers versus, you know, going more intensively to rural areas in terms of socioeconomic distributional effects. But at the same time, in the overall sample, poorer voters are actually more likely to have taken the time to go and, and, and see the debate, potentially because their opportunity cost of time is lower, um, get some gender differences and we don't have an effect for information. So I think the distributional effects are interesting, um, but a little bit of a, a wash. So now, now the actual, let's get to um, the key results. So the first thing is, did voters learn anything from these debates and how does it compare to the pilot? And this, the, the results are quite promising. So this is a kind of an omnibus index of all these different questions, right? So what's candidate A's first priority issue? What's the name of candidate B, this kind of stuff. So they're in standard deviation units. So the pilot had 0.28 standard deviation unit impact on this, on this knowledge index. In the scale up, so the most comparable ones, we get a 0.16 you know, standard deviation unit increase, highly significant. The HD blast is similar, 0.15. Um, if you think about sort of scaling by compliance, these are even kind of the point estimates are larger than this. So so I think that's great in terms of the scale up, you can get similar impacts on voters. The mobilization is positive, but it's not significant. And I already showed you there's nothing for spillovers. Um, so that's so that's that's encouraging. You can at least inform voters at scale in a comparable fashion. Second key thing on the voter side is, does this change their vote choice? And here, remember I was saying, um, we have to find some way to determine who won the debate. And so here we have independent experts watching all of these videos and scoring the candidates, um, the quality of their responses. So we can look at that. So here in 2012, we had this like three and a half percentage point impact on vote shares, which we are not seeing in 2018. So there's are two ways to measure this. One is at the polling center level. And then the second is actually asking voters just their stated or recalled vote. So remember the dilution is, is really low here so that for statistical power, this is going to be a challenge for us, which I think is that you just have to collect a very large amount of data to be able to collect a small, to, sorry, impact, uh, detect a small effect. Uh, at the voter level, we're a little bit better powered, and that's a much larger point estimate, but it's noisy. So I think we need to dig into this a little bit, but it's not clear that at scale, this affected uh, voting behavior. I see I'm running short on time. So let me just whip through the campaign side. Um, quickly and then we can we can open up to, to questions. So the, the campaign effect is actually quite similar in some regards, uh, but not in others. So 
in 2012, we found that candidates increase their campaign activity. So their in-person visit and passing out things like t-shirts and food and, and all that good stuff by about 0.1 standard deviation unit. If you do it, the apples to apples comparison. So I'm just looking within treated constituencies um, for candidates who actually participate in the debate, I have almost identical point estimates, right? So it's 0.09 standard deviation units. So that's like for the guys who participate at scale, they behaved, they responded very similarly to candidates who participate in the pilot. But we can extend this in sort of two ways with the scale up. First, we can look at, let's look at all candidates in the race, regardless of whether they participate in the debate. And here, this effect is getting diluted because the ones who didn't participate in the debate are not responding to the information dissemination in the same way. So that's going down. And then the second thing we can do is more of like a general equilibrium estimate because here, we only have treated candidates, right? So we can only see that they're investing more in debate communities, the treated communities, but we don't know is that, is that a net increase in their campaign effort or just a zero sum reallocation of effort from the control communities who don't have information to the treated communities who do, right? Those are observationally equivalent in the pilot. But now since we have 45 debates where or sorry, 45 constituencies where no debates happen, we can compare all voters in the 45 treated constituencies and the controls and see if there's any evidence of a general, like a net increase in effort. And here the answer is no. So to the extent that we can apply things backwards in time, noting it's gonna be hard to do that because we know a bunch of candidates didn't actually participate or respond with sort of this extra bit of information suggests maybe what, we, what we're seeing here is more of a reallocation towards informed communities than a, than a net increase in effort. Okay, I see I've gone two minutes over. So let me skip, there's some other stuff we did, but let me skip and just kind of put up, summarize really quickly, and then we could just open it up. So two big questions. One is about the political economy of organic scale-ups. And here, I think it's clear candidates not all candidates have strong incentives to participate in information campaigns, but they do seem to be very highly responsive to this kind of coordinating public platform. Voters don't seem to be a big constraint in this context. They seem to have pretty high willingness to pay for information. And I think the private sector has an interesting role to play on both the supply side in terms of those public platforms corralling participation and the demand side in terms of the cinema halls being a really kind of low cost way to blast out information to voters. And then on the concern about you know, is this a, is this, are we worried about basing policy on a small scale ex experiment in this context? All of those different reasons why you might get different results at scale. Political incentives are clearly a big issue, um, obviously, and strongly shaping candidate response with sort of knock on effects on what voters are seeing. But for the candidates who got in, they seem to be behaving very similarly at scale as they did in the pilot in terms of their campaign effort. Voters seem to be learning at similar rates, although it's not clear uh, whether that learning is going all the way um, to voting. Okay, let me uh, let me stop there. Fantastic, thank you so much, Kate. Really, really interesting paper. So if anyone has a question, just uh, raise your hand virtually and I'll, I'll open up uh, your mic. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, maybe let, let me start uh, picking up on, on a couple of questions that came up on the on the Q and A, and and one of them is is related to um, uh, I guess th this is this is already an, a very ambitious experiment, and, and this question is pushing <laughs> another step. No, but uh, but but the, the the question is whether you think there's uh, strategic responses from from the candidates, and I guess this relates to uh, to some of your previous work on on entry exit. And um, so perhaps if you if you have data on the communities that participated in the pilot, do you see any changes in the in the composition of candidates that may give you a lead on on how mm -hmm. do you expect the candidates to respond in the long run? Oh, that's great. Um... So we did we did stratify the scale up with respect to that original sample of of treated and control constituencies. We actually haven't um, we haven't yet done a lot of analysis there. I will say though so that that's getting into pretty small samples because one thing to keep in mind is there's there's a lot of turnover politically. So on average, 
um, only about a quarter of incumbents run for re-election, and then only about half of those get re-elected, which is, I hmm. think, generalizes to other low-income environments, sort of a, there's an incumbency disadvantage because instead of an advantage yeah. of being wealthy one. So th that's all just to say, there's not a lot of people keeping through the sample over hmm. time, but we can, we can definitely look a little bit. I mean, I think hopefully we showed you there's a lot of strategic responses by candidates in terms of do they want to participate in the debate or not. Um, I think it's unlikely we would find anything in terms of people not running for re-election because a debate is coming. I think that's unlikely, but we could certainly we could certainly double check that in the data. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, Karen, you have a question, and then we have Rajesh. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a follow-up question on the I guess it's the welfare implication question in a certain way. So the fact that people self-select out. How do you? How are you thinking about it in terms of of what that means in terms of, of the optimality of the outcome here, which I guess is a bit related, like to to do you have any expectations that they're learning from this and that next year, if next time even if they're new candidates, there may be more take up or not. But even even so, I guess that's two questions: kind of the, the welfare implication on the short run, and then kind of yeah. your expectation on the dynamics on the long run. Yeah, maybe starting with the second one, Karen. So I actually think in terms of what we can do and we haven't done yet, um, but it would be very easy to do, is see in constituencies where there was a debate in the last election, are participation rates higher or lower? Because that doesn't even necessarily need to have the same candidates over time, but just that this, this exposure to it, local exposure. So, so we can definitely look at that. And that, that is potentially a margin of, that I think people would, would respond to. Um, I mean, in terms of welfare, I think one of the things that's nice about debates is this level playing field where challengers are treated in the same fashion as incumbents, you know, all major parties and minor parties are on equal footing. And if people don't show up, you don't, you don't get the complete information on the complete choice set, right? So, so to the extent that people need to know about all their choices to make, you know, a good decision, adherence would be an issue for that. Definitely. I see also Rachel, my co-author is here. So Rachel, you should feel free to jump in too. Cool. Uh, Rajesh, do you, you have a question? Yeah, uh, super interesting talk. You know, I was just, um, I was wondering, you know, one of the results you were showing me was, you know, that individuals were kind of more interested in going and attending debates of their preferred candidates. Um, and I mean, you did, I, I wasn't very clear about what is your voter information index measuring. So how do you, what did you think about voter behavior in the sense, are they, are they looking to learn specifically more about their preferred candidate? Uh, is it just a reaffirmation mm -hmm. effect? Uh, do you find that they end up knowing similar amounts about their own preferred candidate, candidate as compared to who might be challenging them? Or do you have some kind of intuition on what's happening on the ground in terms of people's voters learning desires and, and, yeah. and preferences? That's great. I actually had not thought of that. So your comment is speaking to one direct empirical test, which we could do is break out that learning the actually information gain index into how much you know about the expected preferred candidate versus other candidates. That's fascinating. Haven't done that yet. Um, we could definitely, definitely do that. Um, I mean, I do think this kind of goes back to Karen's question is, you know, when you have kind of very heterogeneous adherence on the candidate side, what are the kind of welfare, but just kind of other implications, right? So I think showing that voters are responding to who's in the debate tells us that, 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 that it matters whether all the candidates are in or not, or which candidates are in or not. Um, but Rajesh, that's a great issue that we could unpack a little bit more in terms of outcomes, in terms of what voters learned. Um, I'm not sure how much more we could say about their motivation other than we have some observable characteristics about them and we see that they go are more likely when there's when there's um, the expected person. We could also, what we haven't done, we could see, we could run the same analysis with um, the incumbent. So whether the incumbent is in the race, but again, we're going down, that will like chop the sample in a quarter because incumbents often don't run again. But that, that's a great comment, Rajesh. Martina? Yeah, so thanks Catherine, uh, very fascinating and uh, very interesting, this scaling up and how to, to make this work broadly. 
but I have a, a, a question that, so you find that the candidates have these weak incentives to supply information, but the voters are willing to pay for it. Mm-hmm. So do you know more on who, is there any candidates that are more willing to supply information? So I'm thinking, is, what is the constraint here? Is it time? Or is it that they don't have time to do this? Is it money they can't afford to do it? Or is it that they simply don't know that voters are willing to pay for it and that the voters uh, want this information? Uh, that mm-hmm. you assume that voters already know this and there's no... Like, do you know why, what this constraint uh, for the candidates are? Yeah, great question. So I think the way we can speak to that most directly is in that initial, like the candidate sample. So some of the intuitive things are, so the way I would think about it is candidates are making a calculus. Do they think this is on net going to increase their electoral chances or reduce them? So I think they're making that calculus. I think the fact that only a quarter of them are sort of willing to do it just on purely individual incentives and that, you know, the more likely to do it when it's a close race. So I think then the potential return is higher. Um, More likely to do it if you're a third party candidate because the returns are higher because nobody knows who you are. You can think about the major party candidates are very advantaged in terms of voters already knowing about them. So they might be more interested, more worried about the downside risk of showing up and having a third party candidate outperform them. So I think that's some of the things uh, that, that we can say there. And again, we could look at like the incumbency rates on that one, which we haven't done yet. Um, but, but I think the other thing is that, that small shift in incentives just by guaranteeing a radio platform was enough to like overturn these constraints in 70% of the races, right? So, so whatever the constraint, so I don't think it's, they don't have, you, you made some good comments like, is it time, is it money? I don't think that's the problem, right? Because as soon as you say this is happening anyway, everybody shows up. So I think it's really more a strategic calculation about what's the likely cost and benefit to, to participating in something that, that's going to inform voters. Great. Um, any other questions uh, from, from the audience? Um, if not, uh, I just posted Kate's uh, Zoom link. I, I guess uh, you need a, a few minutes of, of a break before joining uh, the Zoom link. But if anyone is interested in, in chatting with her about research, uh, she'll be available in, in that link. And I guess we'll call that a, a wrap here. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. In two weeks, we'll have uh, Leonard Wanchekon from Princeton uh, talking uh, with that. So hope you will join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, kids. Fantastic. See you, Rachel.